We're going to move now to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jennifer Kearney, who's an associate professor in the Department of Pharmacology at Northwestern University in the Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Kearney's research program is focused on identifying genetic factors that contribute to childhood epilepsies and comorbidities. Her laboratory develops uh, mouse models for gen um, sorry, her de laboratory develops and uses mouse models for genetic, physiological, and pharmacological studies. Today, she'll be discussing modeling Gervais syndrome in a mouse. Thank you, Dr. Kearney. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about some of our work modeling Dravet syndrome in mouse. So I first wanted to start off just talking a little bit about animal models of disease in general and why we need them. Uh, you've heard this morning about how we can learn a lot from studying patients, uh, which are in essence, the best system to learn about Dravet syndrome in humans. However, uh, at some point in time, we need to have animal models so that we can do more invasive studies uh, or things where safety might be a risk. So one of the key features of animal models is that they provide access to a developing or developed brain. And this is very powerful for neuroscience studies. So we can use these models to study the impact of pathogenic variants uh, of pathogenic variants on fundamental biology at multiple levels of analysis. And this inc can include things like the neuron or synapse circuit, or as a system, uh, meaning the full brain or the brain within the body. They're also helpful for identifying potential biomarkers of disease progression or treatment response. Uh, and they can help us provide additional evidence for therapeutic targets that we're already thinking about uh, or to identify new therapeutic targets. In addition, they can help prioritize candidate therapeutics for future trials. So if a medicinal chemistry effort identifies a series of derivatives, uh, which ones can be carried forward to clinical trials can be narrowed down in the animal model. And finally, for novel therapeutics, we need to evaluate safety in animal models before we can move into humans. So we're very fortunate that for Dravet syndrome, there are a variety of animal models to choose from. Uh, I'm gonna focus on mouse models today, but there are also zebrafish models, fly models, and rabbit model. And these different systems are uh, appropriate for asking different questions sometimes uh, and which system you use uh, is dependent on what you're trying to study. So one of the big advances in Dravet syndrome was when mouse models first became available. Um, and now we're very fortunate that there are a large number of SCM1A mouse models available. This is just a list here of models that are freely available that you can order through a catalog. Um, and it includes a variety of types, uh, knockout mice, conditional knockout mice, uh, knock-ins. And then a recent addition is this uh, last one, which is a GFP reporter mice that use the SCM1A regulatory uh, machinery to drive expression of green fluorescent protein. And this was developed by Dr. Yamakawa's lab. And you can see a picture here of the green fluorescent protein that's being expressed in cells that normally express SCM1A. In addition to this list of animals you can order from catalogs, there are also some additional models that have been developed in individual labs and that can be shared uh, through agreements with those labs. And so for example, the mouse model that we developed in my lab, we deposited at the MMRRC at the Jackson lab and people can order that directly for themselves and don't have to contact me at all. Uh, but we often get contacted directly by other investigators. And over the last six years, we've actually distributed mice to over 20 labs uh, at different places across the world. And this is really a force multiplier because if we send this, these mice out to all these different labs, we can learn a lot more about Dravet syndrome and potential different therapies than we could possibly do by ourselves. <laughs> 
So now I'm going to introduce you to the particular mouse model that we made in my lab. Um, so the assumptions that went into this uh, are that SCMY and haploinsufficiency insufficiency is the major mechanism for Dravet syndrome. And I think that's been pretty well established. And what this fancy word means in essence is that half is not enough. So you can easily model that in mice by knocking out one copy of the mouse SCM1A gene. Another really important thing is that human and mouse NAV1.1, which is the protein product of SCM1A, are 98% identical at the amino acid level and 99% similar. So there's a really strong evolutionary constraint on this protein. And so we can be pretty confident that what we're studying in the in terms of function in the mouse is similar to what happens in humans. So in our case, we knocked out the first coding exon, which is exon one shown here. And when we do that, the heterozygous knockout mice that are shown in this first lane of a Western blot here have about half the amount of NAV1.1 protein compared to their wild type litter mates in the second lane. So the SCM1A knockout heterozygotes, which for the rest of the talk, I'll just refer to as knockouts, uh, they have spontaneous seizures, sudden death that is unexpected in otherwise healthy appearing animals often occurring following a seizure, which sounds a lot like SUDEP. Um, and they also have cognitive and behavioral deficits. And one of the things that's really important for some of the studies that we like to do is that the phenotype's really easy to see um, and we can uh, definitively say, this is a seizure, this is uh, not a seizure. So I'm gonna play a video here that shows a seizure in one of the mice. And so it starts right there. You can see there's a loss of posture um, and you have tonic-clonic convulsions of the limbs. And the animal regains posture. There'll be a phase of wild running. And then this very last phase here is when the limbs go out 180 degrees to the body, that's called tonic hind limb extension. And that indicates to us that the seizure has invaded, invaded the brainstem. And this is a very high risk seizure for death in the mice. So that's really easy to see in phenotype. Uh, we can have lots of people in the lab who can, you know, on their first day, identify a seizure and start phenotyping animals. And that's really critical for doing some of the genetic studies that we do. So this is an overview of the approach that we take. So we start with humans uh, in the human genetics, and we use genome engineering uh, to make a mouse model. So in this case, a knockout mouse. And then we can use these to study disease pathogenesis or to test novel therapies. And we do things both at the level of the whole animal with an intact brain uh, or in brain slices or uh, in neurons that are in a dish. And then one of the things that we do quite a bit of and that I'm going to focus on today is we do genetic mapping and positional cloning to look for mouse modifier genes. And these are genes that by themselves don't really have much of an impact on the health of the animal, but when they're combined with a mutation that causes epilepsy or any other phenotype, they can change the severity of that phenotype. So from these studies, we identify potential modifier genes, and then we need to go back to humans uh, and see if that's relevant. And at the center of all of this is the hope that we can identify novel therapeutic targets for better targeted therapies. So why are we interested in modifier genes? Um, mainly because there's very strong phenotype variability that we see in monogenic epilepsies, including Dravet syndrome. And this can be seen quite nicely in this pedigree here, where this individual indicated by the purple arrow down here was diagnosed with, with Dravet syndrome and has an SCN1A variant, K1372E. Now this variant is present in lots of other members of the family, but those members have different phenotypes, uh, which are not as severe as Dravet, uh, including febrile seizures or febrile seizures, uh, plus various other seizure types. And then very interestingly, 
there are three individuals in this family who have the K1372E variant, but don't have any clinical phenotype associated with it. So these individuals are considered resilient and somehow they've managed to escape having an epilepsy phenotype. So how does this happen? Uh, what are the factors that can contribute to this? So we know that the particular NAV1.1 variant can contribute. So uh, a severe missense mutation uh, might put you between GEFS plus and Dravet syndrome, and you could tip over into, into Dravet syndrome potentially, um, whereas loss of function mutations put you out here at the more severe end. We also know that environment plays an important role. Uh, and this is an interesting illustration of that, uh, where the Montegaza lab took mice that have a GEFS plus mutation, and they subjected them to hyperthermia due seizures on consecutive days for about a week. And what they saw was that they could convert the phenotype from a GEFS plus phenotype, which down here, they really don't have spontaneous seizures, to more of a Dravet-like phenotype with uh, spontaneous seizures that occur almost daily. So the other factor that's important is the genomic background of the individual. And this is where the modifier genes come from. And so here's an example of the SCM1A mice on a particular genetic background have a seizure frequency between two and three per day, whereas on this other background, they're completely protected and don't have any seizures. So we would love to study this in humans, but it's really challenging because you have these three th things playing in at the same time. However, when we use mice, what we can do is we can hold these two factors constant and focus on the genomic background. And we can also generate a lot of animals, which is important to get enough power to do modifier studies. So we take advantage of the inbred mouse strains that are available. And inbred mouse strains have their own unique characteristics. They've been inbred over the last about 100 years. And you can see their characteristics uh, illustrated here with coat color. Uh, but that also includes things like disease susceptibility um, and propensity to develop seizures. And importantly, mice of an inbred strain are essentially uh, identical twins. So we can generate large cohorts of identical twins that we can then use to power up our genetic studies to find modifier genes. So the way this starts is we take our mutant mouse that has a mutation introduced and it's on a particular genetic background. We cross it with a different inbred strain with its own genome. And then we look for exacerbation or suppression of the phenotype. And this happens a surprising amount of time and probably more mouse models uh, have this phenomenon happening uh, than don't. So as you can probably guess, there is indeed strain dependent phenotype variability for the SCM1A knockout mice. On the 129 strain that we maintain them on, they actually don't have any overt phenotype. However, when we cross them with C57 black 6 j and we get F1 offspring, so for each of their chromosome pairs, they have one from 129 and one from black 6 And in this F1 generation, we've unmasked the phenotype. And so these mice have spontaneous seizures that are shown uh, over here on the left. So they have between two and three seizures per day whereas the 129 mice do not have any spontaneous seizures. And we also see a difference in survival. So the 129 background, they have relatively normal survival, whereas on the F1 background, we have this precipitous uh, premature lethality between three and five weeks of age, and then uh, only about 25% survive out to 14 weeks of age. So this is a very dramatic difference in the seizure and survival phenotypes and it's very ripe for looking for modifiers. So we can also see strain dependence at the level of individual neurons. So in this case, this is whole cell sodium current recordings from hippocampal interneurons. And so when we look at neurons isolated from F1 uh, knockout mice in red and wild type mice in gray, what we can see is that there's 
decreased sodium current density in the SEM1A knockout compared to their wild type litter mates. In contrast, when we isolate neurons from the 129 mice that don't express uh, an epilepsy phenotype, we see no difference between wild type and knockout neurons. So this uh, phenotype difference is even seen at the inner neuron level. So that raises the question of what are the responsible genetic modifiers? And so we get to these by doing large genetic studies um, and do genetic mapping. So in this first study, we identified loci on four different chromosomes, uh, mouse chromosomes 5, 7, 8, and 11. And this coarse genetic mapping gets us to a region like this, which I've shown just chromosome 5 here. It's a about 93 megabases, and that's huge. It covers almost two thirds of a chromosome. So then the next step is that we need to do fine mapping uh, so that we can get down to a tractable interval to look at candidate genes. And so with fine mapping, we can get from about 90 megabases down to this case, nine. And within that interval, there are about 119s. Um, and of those 40 are expressed in brain. And that's the first filter that we use in our candidate gene analysis if we're looking for a neurological phenotype. So among those genes, there were coding sequence variants. So amino acid changes in essence in four different genes, but they were all predicted to be benign. We also saw differential expression uh, from an RNA-seq study uh, with only three genes showing differential expression. And one of those jumped out at us immediately. And that's the GABA-A2 gene, which encodes a GABA-A alpha, subun GABA alpha subunit type two protein. So there's about a threefold expression difference between the 129 strain and the susceptible black six strain. And the F1 sit about in the middle. And this is recapitulated at the protein level as well. So from that, the next question we ask is, can we make a story about this? And so we develop a working model of how, how these two things might interact. So if we think about the wild type case, uh, you have NAV 1.1, which is important for uh, propagating action potentials into the nerve terminal, presynaptic inhibitory neurons. And then that will cause GABA release which then interacts with GABA-A receptors on the postsynaptic side, and you get inhibition. So in the case of Dravet syndrome, there are fewer NAV1.1 uh, channels. And so you have a less robust propagation into the nerve terminal and less GABA release for a given stimulus. And so your amount of inhibition will be smaller. Now you can imagine if you couple this situation here with fewer GABA-A receptors on the opposite postsynaptic side, so fewer receptors to receive the signal, you could imagine that you would have even less inhibition. So at the same time that we were uh, pursuing the GABA-A receptor uh, subunit as our modifier gene, our colleagues, Megan Mulligan and Rob Williams, were also looking at this expression difference uh, in a systems genetics study where they noted that C57 black 6 j has a much lower expression level than almost any strain that they looked at. And here's just a series of them here. And so they wanted to find the particular cause of that difference. And so what they did is they compared genome sequence data between C57 black 6 j uh, and all the other strains that were available. And what they found is that there's a single base pair deletion that's upstream of exon 5. And what this uh, causes is inefficient splicing. And so you get less productive uh, GABA-A2 message that can be turned into protein. And to really uh, solidify this, what they did is they repaired this by inserting a T back into the Black 6J genome, 
and they were able to restore expression. So they were kind enough to share these mice with us uh, before their study was published. Um, and so in this case, I'm just showing you the rescue of expression. And so here's the black six transcript expression here, which is set at one. And if we have one repaired allele opposite black six, we get uh, about a twofold increase in expression. And if we have the repaired black six version opposite 129, we're back at homozygous 129 level. So we have restored expression at the transcript level. And again, that's recapitulated at the protein level. So then we asked the question is, can this rescue SCM1A phenotypes? And so what we did is we took our 129 SCM1A knockout heterozygotes and crossed them with the black six Gaber A2 mice uh, that had one copy of the edited allele and one copy that was not edited. And in the offspring, we looked at the uh, SCM1A knockout mice that either had edited 129 alleles at GABR A2 or black 6 129 alleles, which would be equivalent to our F1 wild type controls. And what we found is that there was a dramatic improvement in survival. So here's the F1 in red and we get almost complete rescue of survival uh, with just changing that single nucleotide. In addition, we also get uh, rescue of seizure phenotypes. So the F mice with the F1 edited version have lower seizure frequency. And very importantly, in the few animals that have seizures, a much smaller proportion of their seizures and with that tonic hind limb extension that I showed you in the video, which puts them at high risk for death. So they have seizures that are less severe and less risk of causing death. So going back to our working model, uh, I think we have shown that with genetic rescue uh, that we can restore uh, GABA A receptors to the postsynaptic side and restore a bit of the inhibition. But then we also were curious if we could do a pharmacologic rescue because a genetic rescue is easy to do in the mouse, not so easy to do in humans. And so for a pharmacologic rescue, we wanted to know if we could amplify the signal that comes from the remaining GABA A receptors and try to boost inhibition that way. And so the GABA A receptor is actually perfect for this uh, type of an approach. Um, so this is a version of a GABA A receptor here. It's a pentameric receptor and the GABA binding site is over here. And they have a benzodiazepine binding site that is away from the GABA site. And what this does is when you have GABA bound along with a benzodiazepine, you get a boost in the signal relative to just GABA by itself. And so we can take advantage of that site and also the tremendous amount of medicinal chemistry work that's happened around GABA-A receptor subunit selective modulators. Um, so there has been effort to separate alpha-2-3 containing receptors, which are important for anxiety, pain, and epilepsy, which is what we're interested in, and separate that away from particularly alpha-1, which is uh, the subunit that's responsible for most of the sedative effects that you get from uh, benzodiazepines that bind less selectively. So for instance, midazolam. So we know that clobazam, which is a first line therapy for Dravet syndrome, is alpha-2-3 preferring uh, positive allosteric modulator. So uh, that may be why we can use that as a maintenance therapy. Uh, compared to a benzodiazepine like midazolam, which would just be a rescue medication. But preferring means that it has a modest uh, affinity above for alpha two and three above and beyond alpha one, but it does still bind to alpha one. And so we wanted to look for something that was a bit more selective. And so we settled on this AstraZeneca compound, AZD7325, which is alpha-2-3 selective. And we asked the question of whether we could get seizure protection. 
And in this case, we used a hyperthermia induced seizure assay. So we put the mice in a chamber and they're fitted with a thermometer that controls a heat lamp and raises their body temperature gradually. And what we found is that the threshold temperature, which is on the y-axis here, at which they reached a seizure increased when you had that AC, ACD 7325 on board and it was dose dependent. And importantly, there are no obvious sedative effects. So this is an open field assay. Um, this is a tracking of mouse movements, uh, just as a representative example for vehicle in the ACD group. Uh, and when that's quantitated, you can see that there's no difference in the distance traveled, suggesting that there's not uh, a profound sedative effect. So just in the last minute, I wanted to uh, touch on the fact that we don't always find things that are quite so obvious as the uh, subunit of the GABA-A receptor. Um, so hepatic leukemia factor is another modifier gene that we found on a different chromosome. And when you combine the SCN1A mutation with heterozygous deletion of HLF, you exacerbate uh, the survival phenotype. And despite its name, uh, HLF is actually a transcription factor that's important uh, for regulating expression of PDXK, which is a critical rate limiting enzyme in the vitamin B6 pathway. And it's well known that vitamin B6, the active form, which is PLP, is a critical cofactor for neurotransmitter synthesis. And there are vitamin B6 dependent epilepsies uh, that have mutations in different aspects of this pathway. And so this suggests that uh, any disruption in this pathway could exacerbate Dervais syndrome phenotypes. So then, as I mentioned, we need to always go back to humans um, and make sure that what we're doing actually has any relevance to human epilepsies. And so what we've done is looked at the risk genes for genetic generalized epilepsies that were found in two large GWAS studies um, that included 15 or 10,000 cases each. And the genes that we have identified in a few hundred mice are popping up in these studies. So there's GABA-A2, um, the vitamin B6 pathway, which PMPO is one of another one of the critical enzymes. Uh, and then over here is cacna one g which is uh, another modifier gene that I didn't have time to talk about. So I think we're, we're doing okay. We find genes in the mouse with a couple hundred mice and we're hitting the same things that you can hit with uh, 10 to 15,000 humans. Uh, so I think we're on the right path. And just to summarize and wrap it up, I hope I've convinced you that mouse models are useful systems for studying genetic interactions and potential therapies, and that genetic modifiers contribute to the variable presentation, um, particularly in our case, epilepsy risk, and that where you end up on the spectrum depends not only on the pathogenic mutation that may be driving the disease, but also what else is in the background genome that may push you between the severe and more mild ends of the spectrum. And characterizing the mechanisms underlying these genetic variants can help us evaluate risk uh, and suggest targeted therapy. And finally, just some acknowledgments. Uh, the people in my lab that are shown in purple here, which I've had their pictures along the way, have contributed to this along with our collaborators, Toshihiro in the Nice Contractors Lab um, and Mystery and Chris Thompson in Al George's lab, uh, as well as Megan Mulligan and Rob Williams and Greg Pomonix who were involved in the Gabaret to uh, rescue mice uh, and our clinical collaborators at Lurie Children's Hospital. And finally, our funding sources which is NINDS um, and also our Channelopathy Associated Research Center and uh, more recently, some funding from Dravet Syndrome Foundation to look at modifiers, which I didn't necessarily talk about today, but uh, hope to talk about in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kearney, for that talk and for joining us for a Q&A.
Um, I've got a few questions that are filtering in through the chat, so I'll just go ahead and dive in. Okay. Um, the first question came in near the beginning of your talk asking about what are the methods that you use to knock out a copy of just one or knock out one copy of SCN1A in a mouse model? So it's actually something, the way that we did it in 2010 uh, was by a method called homologous recombination uh, in mouse embryonic stem cells. Now we would use CRISPR, uh, which is much easier, it's faster, uh, and it's more efficient. Uh, so, you know, something that used to take about a year and a half, we can do in three months and for a lot less cost, but uh, it, it gives you a similar result. So that's what we would do currently. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question I had was, you spoke a lot about AZD7325. Do you happen to know if AstraZeneca is planning to move that forward in patients? So it, they have been looking at it for as an anxiolytic, so for anxiety disorders. Um, I, I'm not up to speed on where it, it sits at the moment. Um, they have not really been pursuing it for epilepsy indications. Um, and there may be some things on the horizon that are actually better uh, and would have um, some more useful properties for epilepsies. So I think it's representative of a class, but it's really, that was really for us just a tool that we could use to test the hypothesis. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the next question is sort of going back to thinking about the modifier genes. And um, so this is asking if you think that um, patients with Gervais syndrome should have additional uh, genetic testing, including whole genome panels to help highlight what these other uh, modifier genes might be. Do you think that's important now or do you think there will be a place yeah. in the future for that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, we're, we're both fortunate that Dervais syndrome is a clinical diagnosis where genetic testing can be very focused because SCN1A is what most often comes up. On the flip side, you don't get that additional information. Um, I, would, I think you would need some uh, pretty well-powered genetic studies to happen first before diving into using that as a clinical uh, diagnostic. I think modifier genes in general for rare disease, it's very hard to get enough power to be confident. And you, you really need to be confident before you move that kind of genetic risk profile into the clinic. Uh, but I think it is valuable in terms of thinking about different pathways that could be targeted for therapies, which doesn't necessarily mean that you, ne that you need to test each individual uh, because these are probably going to be shared pathways. Makes sense. Um, as a follow-up, they asked if there are plans to kind of do this sort of thing as a confirmation of the mouse models, but I, I think that is sort of what your lab is already doing, right? Looking at kind of comparing, or your lab and other labs, comparing yeah these modifiers and using actual, you know, patient samples to look at their yeah. genetics too, right? So I think in an ideal world, yes, we would do a, a large genetic study in as many uh, survey cases as we possibly could get our hands on and then to look at the rest of the genome. Um, it, that is, I think, something that would be useful. It's just the number of cases that you need to have to have sufficient power is quite large, so it's really a challenge. Um, but I think it could be doable. Um, and certainly the rest of sequencing the rest of the genome, the price of that has come way down. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's probably something that's worth considering for uh, a DSF type of study. Great. Um, another question that came in is, what are the translational behavioral phenotypes that you or other labs have seen um, in the two different uh, backgrounds of the Gervais syndrome mouse model? Yeah, so that's a, that's a hard 
uh, issue and I know that we talk about it we talk about seizures a lot and that's because seizures are a translationally validated endpoint uh, that we're pretty confident of the translation between mouse and humans behavior is a whole nother ball of wax it's it's very challenging to take behavior of mice who happen to the SCN1A mice happen to have a hot, very high level of anxiety. So that plays into any behavioral task that you ask them to do. Uh, so it's, it's very challenging to take that information and translate it directly to behaviors in humans. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are things that anxiety is actually probably the exception. Anxiety has a pretty good translational um, track record, but, you know, sort of autism spectrum phenotypes um, and cognitive phenotypes, it's a little bit harder because it's all clouded by that anxiety phenotype. So, you know, we've, we've done a small amount of behavior, but we've largely steered away from it just because we, we don't have confidence that we're measuring something that's relevant. That makes sense. I think we have time to get one last question in before we need to move on because we're already a little behind in our program. Um, th this question was asking, what environmental factors are there influencing the severity of symptoms? Yeah, so that's, again, that's a great question. Um, we, we know that with um, some, some other mouse models, uh, you can change the environment uh, of the cage, so you can do what's called an enriched environment, and you put all kinds of uh, habitat toys, basically things you would find, a, you know, in the pet store for hamsters. You can put all kinds of things in the cage, and that actually will lessen uh, seizures and will improve uh, some other outcomes. We see environmental effects with with our Trevay mice in terms of if if things are going you know, if there's something happening in the animal facility where, like, construction, um, we can see worsening of phenotypes. <laughs> um, during the pandemic, we had excellent survival uh, because really only one person was going in the room once a day, and it was extremely quiet. Uh, so environment definitely plays into, the, into uh, phenotypes, both in mice and, of course, in humans, and that's why, you know, you spend so much time and energy trying trying different occupational therapies and you know those are all valuable enriching things great thank you for uh fielding these really difficult questions to answer sure. um, and thank you so much for your talk we really appreciate it thank you great. bye everybody thank you.